that has not moved the demand from last year. Although we saw the only other demand was for this. Therefore, we have chosen that team. Therefore, it goes that. We should be also explaining what the culture and how the missionaries for Christianity. Let me put forward how the culture is defined. The Cambridge Dictionary describes culture as a way of life, especially the general customs and beliefs of a particular group of people at a particular time. Culture, as a word, is said to encompass the social behavior and norms found in human societies, as well as knowledge, beliefs, arts, laws, customs, capabilities, and habits of individuals in these groups. According to Wikipedia, a cultural norm qualifies acceptable conduct in society. It serves as guideline for behavior, dress, language, outward behavior in a situation which serves as a template for expectation in a social group. Every group of people has its own informal form that spells out the content of its members. While some aspects of culture might be acceptable across a number of communities, some can only apply to individual communities. The introduction of Christianity in Africa by Western missionary was embraced in part and persisted in part by the indigenous communities. For example, those who converted to Christianity found it easy to accept water baptism following conversion, which was completely alien to African culture because most of the countries like to water. Most traditional forms of worship involved sacrifices that were understood to appease the spirits of the ancestors. Nearly all of those sacrifices required the shedding of the blood. This also proved argumentative because Christianity required the converts to recognize the death of Christ as the last sacrifice that God required from humanity. Of forgiveness of the human sins. The new converts were required to put away their traditional ways of worship and exclusively worship God in manner prescribed by the Bible. It is important to point out that the missionaries were not the originators of the gospel message. They too were recipients of the same. Having embraced the gospel, they took it upon themselves to spread it to other parts of the world. There is no one culture which, which is superior to another. Culture in Namibia is a blend of many different people, and its culture and customs have absorbed both African and European elements and fuse them into a blend of the two. Although the country is urbanizing rapidly, the majority of Namibians still live in rural areas and live largely in population life. It is amazing. It is among these people, however, the cultural tradition survived most Strongly. Namibian religions are dominated by various branches of Christianity. With more than 90% of Namibian citizens 
identifying themselves as Christians, according to Namibia Demographic and Health Survey of 2013. The proportions are 65.1 percent Protestant, which includes Lutheran, Seventh-day Adventists, Anglican, or other Protestant denominations. 22.8 percentage Roman Catholic, both Protestant and Roman Catholic, together make 87.9 percentage. 10.5 non-Christian religions, primarily African traditional religions, Sunni Islam, and Buddhism. 1.5 percentage is unaffiliated or field religions. Having said the bit of culture and about Christianity and other religions, we are here to hear about more on this topic from our eminent personality. We are all here to listen to our beloved presentators who will be introduced by the more wretch. Now let me enter into my duty. Dear Reverend Father Penny, the Secretary General of NCD, dear Reverend Father Mafias, dear Reverend Tomates, dear Reverend Sisters. Dear seminarians and my dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm so happy to welcome our keynote speaker, Miss Lucia Nepunda. Unfortunately, after writing the whole document, she had a very unfortunate situation in her family. She had to take the family member to the hospital in the morning. Let us pray for her husband in a deep manner. She was willing to be with us anyway. Five days ago, she has sent all the notes that she has to pray. So, in her absence, let's welcome her. And also, I welcome Father Anthony James, who has taken up that position to read out her paper, which has been presented by her. Welcome to Mrs. Lucia and Dr. Father Andrew. We have our moderator, Mr. Sister Christine Mateus, who is so energetic and enthusiastic. We know her well. Let us welcome her to our midst. We have our great and important personality who have toiled to enrich us. They are Seminari, Samuele Lugosi, Ms. Sanja Teresa, Mr. Katea Jeromi, and Reverend Father Matthias Bayamar. Let us put them and welcome them and appreciate them with our thoughts. We also have Cultural Dance Academy, where I can do offer their value persons and cultural show for us. We are indebted to you for your availability for us and teaching us various cultural and traditional dress, language, music, dance, etc. In the name of all, I cordially welcome you. We are our fathers, deacons, teachers, sisters, and brothers, and now it is ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all into this memorable day. Since I do not get another chance to express my sentiments of gratitude, I take this opportunity sincerely. <laughs> welcome and thank our seminary fathers for their commitment and energy this day in a very special. Mother Simone, Sister Vicente, for their financial help when they could make it a grand success. I welcome and thank you for your generous heart. 
I am so proud of Mother Maria and Nancy and the Holy Ghost sisters who are made this marvelous. May the Lord bless them. In the name of all, I welcome them and I thank them. I also acknowledge student forum members, Leo, Mehale, and Asipe for contacting the presentators of the day and working out every minor detail. A big applause to them. And also, without forgetting all the seminarians, one way or other, for their tireless work. Once, once again, I welcome you all. May God bless you. I again. Thank you. Before leaving the stage, we have brought out already for the Alaska and the for 2023. Religion also 
procedures, cultural change based upon change brought by Christianity. For example, we see the circumcision of Jesus, which was a cultural practice by the Jewish people and it was also part of the Jewish religion. The definition for culture, according to Taylor, culture is that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, arts, morals, law, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of the society. And the definition for Christianity given by the famous dictionary is that it is a religion based on belief in God and the life and teachings of Jesus Christ and on the Bible. And now we see the links between Christianity and culture, particularly in the Namibian context. In Christianity we pray, and prayer is something that has been done from long ago. It has been a norm in the Wambo to pray to God, proclaiming Him as the Almighty and Self-Creator. Culturally, we conduct different prayers, such as for rain, for daily prayer, and during different ceremonies. We always ask God to bless us. <coughs> this is also just as the Bible indicates in Matthew chapter 6 verse 11. We always pray and praise God with problems such as God will never forsake you like your mother. In Christianity, we talk about problems which existed long ago before Jesus Christ was born. And it is well stated in the book of Genesis chapter 49, verse 1 to 27. And we also know that Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. And here we see our funny way plan. There are also other tribes, such as Dan, who belong to similar to the or a new pope plan that is important for saying. Or the Benjamin tribe that we see in the Bible. And here, the similar one that we see is Omkwene Kamba, which is what we call real in the China, etc. And in culture, we also have curtains as well, especially in the and now in Christianity we have confirmation into adultery, while in culture we have the ritual ceremony which we call as people. Culturally there is a common practice, Oshite, or the harvest of first fruits to thank God for the bumper harvest and good rain. So as in Christianity, the same is practiced as mentioned in the Bible, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. There is a taboo in culture that family members cannot engage in sexual relations with both family members, just as it is outlined in the Bible, the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, verse 6 to 22. In Christianity, we involve God in everything that we do. Also in culture, we believe and consult our ancestors. In culture, if there is a sick person, they call the traditional healers or the herbalists to perform certain rituals for healing. While in Christianity, we call church leaders to anoint and lay hands to in part healing, especially as it is mentioned in the letter of St. James. In culture, we serve just traditional good beer, that is omelodo, during ceremonies such as weddings and to visitors, etc. Just as we know that Jesus turned water into wine 
as a unique piece of Anna that is mentioned in the book of the Gospel of John, chapter 2. In Christianity, when someone, for example, commits adultery, which is against the commandments, the sixth commandment, such a person receives judgment and restitution thereafter. While in culture, you get fined for committing adultery. Culturally, we cannot so culturally we connect with ancestral spirits, while in Christianity, we connect to the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. In Christianity, couples can get married, commonly known as the modern weddings, just as there are traditional weddings. Both in culture and Christianity maintain order through the dressing codes. And culture imparts knowledge in people on how to live and behave, while Christianity teaches us not to be ignorant, just as the Bible says, my people perish from a lack of knowledge, as we see in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. And we also see that both culture and Christianity are important in society, and we cannot separate them. Their ultimate goal is to maintain order, discipline, ethics, and morality in human society. Furthermore, Christianity is more than religious beliefs. It is also a culture. As long as something is done from generation to generation, it is a culture. So it is important that we encourage and uphold culture and Christianity in our society. Any nation without the two pillars is a lost nation. And any nation that kept one without the other is usually the nation with a left hand without the right because they work and they act. We thank the missionaries because they try as much as possible to convert one of people into Christianity, as well as Martin Luther, who incorporated ceremonies such as outdoor ceremony, a critique, and the inauguration of the new person. This shows the importance of keeping the two pillars in. Finally, we really thank the church for incorporating culture in their teaching. Even though more still has to be done for culture and Christianity to move together to keep up both culture and religious knowledge in society. So that is the presentation on the significance of culture in Christianity. Thank you.
gives us three possible explanations of its origins, and he says, people came to believe in the supreme being through reflecting in the universe. Since they believe that the world has been created, it means that there is the creator of the universe, and they call the creator the supreme being. From there, they came with the knowledge that the universe should have an origin, and the person who has originated. And they considered that person as the same supreme being. The second reason is people realize their own limitations. People realize the limitations and weaknesses of their knowledge and powers. Africans first realize that they cannot control death calamity and the forces like thunderstorms, earthquakes, mighty rivers, and great forests. And this made them to realize that there must be someone greater than themselves and greater than the world who had full control over it. So they thought that they should depend more on the, on the person who is more powerful. The third one is people observe the forces of nature. People thought that they cannot reach in the sky, but they depended more on it. For example, they get light from the sky, which is the sun, and the rain is also from the sky, and from there they began to associate heaven with the person they called the Supreme Being. Names of God. All the African people have a word for a name for God, and those names, they have a meaning, and they describe, and their meaning describes the knowledge and their relationship with the Supreme Being. These personal names of God are very old, and for that, in some cases, their meanings are no longer known, and it is not easy to trace them. But here, I will look to some of them and their meanings according to the tribes. In the Romano of the Kabago tribes, here in Namibia, they call him Omba Karunga, which means King of God. That exactly explains the way Romanian people had their deep relationship with him, and it simply means that to them he is the king, the most high. In Nyeba, that is one of the Angolian tribes, and also the Babos in Namibia, they call him Mwene, which means the owner. As I have stated in the previous paragraph, that the people knew that the world originated, so they considered the supreme being as the owner of the universe, and all that is in it. It is the path, which means the one who came first. He controls the universe, but cannot be approached by the human beings directly. God created all things, and from that, he can believe that he is also the one who provides everything for the sustenance and for their food. He provides light from the sky for everyone. This made Africans to depend on him also for their sustenance, for rain and for food come only when they have received enough rain. And that made them to always look up to them, to the security whenever they need rain. Vicky says, and I quote, Sunshine is one of the expressions of God's providence as held by some people like the Akan, Angore, Ipira, Pele, and Gila. The sun appears day, the sun appears every day, providing light, warmth, change of season, and the growth of crops. This is very vital. So the Akan calls God the shining one to signify that he is involved in the life of celestial bodies who shining symbolizes his presence in the universe. Nature and the attributes of God. In this section, I would like to look deep on the question, who is God in Africa, and what is he like, and what, is, what makes him truly God. And this will only appear when we look at the attributes of God. Since African people know that no one ever have, has ever seen God, so the attributes of God will help us to understand his nature and all the questions that we have about him. 
The certain ideas about the nature of God is set up by the religious society of the Africans. These ideas concern his real deep, that which differentiates him from the things he has been. The titles and attributes accorded to God by various books of Caribbean peoples express the providence of God, the creator and the giver of all things. God is good. Many African countries they have described the secret being as God because the belief is that he is not only the maker of all things, but he is good towards all the people and all things. So people associated all good things they had with this supreme being. For example, the people of Zaire say God never does wrong to people. And in Liberia, they say God causes rain to pour down on our fields and the sun to shine. Since we see these things of his, we say that he is good. And in Ghana, they only say God is good because he has never withdrawn all the good things he has given to them. The land he considers the rich harvest to come from him. This is most interesting. The most interesting thing is that the land he invoked him in his own daily to grant fertility to their women, cattle, and fields. Believing that God is essentially good, the Baruti do not wish to thank him since it is his right to do good things for them. However, there are many similar sayings in Africa that show that people consider God to be absolutely good and that his goodness never ends. In contrary to that, there are situations where calamities, misfortunes, and sufferings come upon families or individuals for which there is no clear explanation. Some societies will consider this to be brought about by God, generally through agents like spirits or magic workers, or as punishment for contravening certain customs or traditions. By so doing, they do not consider God to be intrinsically given as such. That is simply a rational explanation of what may otherwise be hard to explain. God is holy. Concerning the holiness of God, little is directly said by the African people as far as the records show. The inner holds that God cannot be charged with an offense since he is above the level of all failure, wrongdoing, and unrighteousness. In Europe, God is the pure king who is without blemish. The Nigerians also speak of him as the pure king without blemish and the whiteness without patterns. In Kenya, some people speak of him as the possessor of whiteness and associate him with the snowy, with the snowy top of Mount Kenya. Since God is not to be holy and without blemish, people everywhere are careful in making sacrifices to him. However, these attributes are a lot, for example, God is all powerful, God is all knowing, God is there, is present everywhere, God is living best, etc. But all these attributes they show who God is in Africa and how people have experienced experience his presence among them. In conclusion, the nature of God escapes, escapes human comprehension. The nature of God is why God has escaped a human comprehension. The nature of God is why God has escaped a human comprehension.
it is not an easy topic, but it's a joy to speak of this topic today. Uh, the question is not an easy about sales and assisted joy is rather a tricky one. Uh, ignore the presentation outline about sales and assisted joy. Right. For a few of us, without putting too much um, thoughts in it, um, the um, saints and our sisters hold, we hold an expectation that these two uh, perform common tasks. Um, they are not in the institution of each other. Um, they watch over us, they protect us, they guide us, and they speak on our behalf. And they stand there to form a link between us and higher power, which they now believe in close union in the spiritual space. Now, um, the days such as these, are very interesting because as I listened to my to the speakers who did so before me, I was trying to uh, place this um, within the space of today. And I was saying the organizers of this event are being applauded. Because the way we organize these talks is out of the organized. Can you satisfy us that those who have gone before us are not asleep, but better even is not dead. They are important persons to us. They are in real communion with us. Real communion with us. Let's quickly say on who the saints may be understood to be. Saints or sainthood in the Catholic Church, it's not foreign, it's clear. And I believe that it's not questioned except by those who are listening to many other voices uh, from elsewhere. That's all I can say now. But among Catholics, I mean real Catholic believers, this sainthood is not to be questioned. Even some priests of the Catholic Holy Mass refer to the saints as they are us still, protecting us, communicating with us, as is uh, giving inspiration, strength, again, to us. A special decree of the Council of um, ours that saints pray together with Christ to pray God for humanity. And even this morning, I was reading something and I love social media. Um, and, and there was a picture of the missionary Catholics kneeling at the front of the Catholic and then there were more than gentlemen, white suits, and uh, we were kneeling as the prophet approached. And uh, the, the author of that post was the question someone help me them to differentiate between the Catholics and the, the, those who worship their papas. And that, that was the only question I was to them. And I didn't even continue to, to crack my head or to try to explain because the person who thought that without just looking at the next such place is ignorant. Because the reason and what we do as we know that places such as the grotto has nothing to do with or compared to what these guys do in the world purpose or what we compare it to what we do 
at mass when we kneel in um, our schools and the sacrament, for example. And all these things are the least. If someone brings the social media and wants us to argue there, uh, my two sister here was posted and said, if you doubt, then go and I <laughs> Because those are the only people who can With us, uh, we are willing to explain, but only somebody who is willing to understand. Therefore, we do not say our saints are reigning as gods. We are not saying our saints are equal to Christ. We are not saying. We are praying to the saints as to the God. And we are talking about what um, our Catholic, our Catholic Church has introduced to us from the onset of our introduction to Catholicism as young children. The saints share the intercession of Christ by his goodness towards us and the saints. Now, uh, that that spirit with the same share, this is the session of Christ. We believe that these people have lived lives worthy of being in a close communion with Christ and ultimately in God. And therefore, even as we as the may have lived, we don't even also say there are some who have outdone their Christ's mission of salvation. They are there, Christ, they live lives inspired by the salvific history and all that, and therefore they live now with Christ, the intercedent for us to God. Now, understanding who the saints are is very important to me today. Discussion. Now, the saints are those who meritorious, uh, whose meritorious behaviors Christ rewards in their earthly lives by giving ear to them in their heavenly lives. I don't even know I understand it myself. But it, it, it is why it is uh, because they have emulated Christ like lives, they have been found worthy to, to live Christ closely emulate Christ like lives. And therefore, if they have imitated Christ in their earthly lives, Christ have seen it fit. To, for them to merit lives hereafter that are very close to invention, or a very close reality to that of this. It is the fact that to object to honoring or praying to saints is evidence of limited, limited sense of ecclesial awareness and of an excessively individual, personal, private form of religion. I did not say that. It is out there. Mother Church brings this to us in these great documents. Now, if we buy into the, the criticisms and the arguments, I know many, especially our sisters and our priests and our brothers who go in, you know, religious attire. I believe when you are met in in in, hallways, in in city centers, people stop and say, "Hello, you confused ones. <laughs> what? What is this? You know." Um, and, 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 and on one occasion, I say, "If one was better informed, they would approach you as you really should be approached and say, hey, how did you find that? How can I find that? But, but it's unfortunate. Um, it is not known by many. And by being um, loving to criticize, 
we we they are approached um, with such um, type of questions or comments. Now, um, when we uh, it is argued too uh, that uh, uh, or if say simply saints are those who during their early lives lived in accordance with the will of God. Canonized saints are those who, after they die, can I not be a saint before I die? I, I'm saying now here, uh, canonized saints are those who, after they die, the Catholic Church follows certain procedures to announce to the world the merit of their works and the worldly life and uh, through evidence, I, I, I am saying, and through evidence uh, to the world, um, encourage those who are alive to emulate them and seek their intercession. I, I, I specifically made reference to, uh, let's, let's just move to the slide there. I specifically made a reference to canonized saints uh, because as, as I, I, I appreciate the challenge of being invited to speak to topics such as this that means somebody cares out there and says go and visit some literature and improve on your faith and remind yourself. So I had a little bit of time to read and you realize that a lot of um, authors would argue that while the Catholic Church canonizes those that merit this canonization, there are also unspoken about and saints uh, in our lives. So, um, therefore, the question there of uncanonized saints, do they exist? And I answered myself. Because I was not told there would be question and answer sessions, I say they to exist. And as we move to who the ancestors are, you may be partly agreeing with me to say perhaps these form part of our uncanonized saints. Some of them definitely. Our ancestors, there is an open of several statements regarding Africa. I read and hear writers and speakers make the comfortable accentuations regarding Africa. For example, in Africa, ancestors are regarded as, or in Africa, or Africans believe in soul and soul, or in Africa, like one um, document that I, I, I come across, it says um, um, about 8% of the African Roman Catholics uh, worship ancestors. And, and as I read, I said, no. But unfortunately, I said that to myself only because even the author couldn't hear me. Why can we agree that Africa's multilingual, multicultural, multi belief systems? And multi practices can be overwhelmingly too broad to study or seek to understand, like if, if you seek to understand individual cultures in Africa, uh, forget about Africa. If you, if you try to understand individual cultures in Namibia, which is a multicultural um, country by nature, and with a huge element of man-made multiculturalism, you hardly finish to uh, seek to understand this. And my argument here is that even if Africa is way too broad and uh, you know is is made up of multiple um, cultures and characteristics. It does not give us, as scholars and authors, the right to generalize who we are. And therefore, 
Um, and I say, I will be a little bit uncomfortable to claim that most of what we do in art is the same. My departure point lies in the fact that spatial, geographical, economical, sociological, traditional, name it all, therefore psychological and spiritual experiences, which in many places are not the same, although they may be found with some commonalities. Um, we may proceed. For an Ashwango speaker that I am, Ancestors are our Kwahungu, namely our Ithika. These are departed um, and usually elderly members of our family, totem, or lineage. There is no written rule as to who should be regarded as such. Nobody will tell you that this one should be your ancestor, this one you should regard this uh, departed beloved as an ancestor, right? Um, and therefore, it is common to find that among family members, individuals have connections with different departed members whom they believe have the ability to care for them, to protect them, to speak for them, and even guide them on their every journey. Ancestors in my culture, and when I say my culture, I'm not even talking about Oshiwambo culture and the Kwambi. And one will even say, Father Matthias, you will say, but look, you are just a Kwambi for Kwambi. If you come to, uh, uh, to, to, to Achinia, then please, Father, don't beat me up. Um, uh, we, we don't do such things. You don't be surprised. Um, because as I, 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 I made reference earlier, Geographical experiences, experiences, sociological experiences make us all very unique. Um, and therefore, ancestors um, are respected and at times feared. And I want to explain here, here that we do not fear them like they will kill you, but the fear of the respect. Because some believe that if you disrespect and you displease them, they may cause you harm or bad luck. Now, this is not only common to ancestors, you know, our dead. It's even common in my culture that if you displease your parents, if you displease elders, and you leave home and an elder spit you out and did not bless you that you go safe, I assure you, you will arrive with them, you will look for jobs you will never find, you will find an illusion of love and get happiness. You will you will see a glimpse of goodness, but you will not get it. That's why some people say go back home. If anything goes say sorry. If you need to say sorry to an ancestor who is departed, you go and be taught by the elders where to go and what to do. If they are alive, go and apologize and express how sorry you are and how much better of a child you will be from their own. When you get that blessing, then they will not cause you harm or bad luck. In fact, it's not them causing you that. Ancestors, um, and I will therefore um, lie if I say this is how Africans or even Namibians relate to or understand the concept of ancestors. Although, as I said earlier, we have a lot in common. Come on, um, while I mentioned uh, a while ago that individuals may have a special connection with different RTP, namely Abamungo, it is not uncommon to find ancestors who are respected, and it is expected that all family members be respectfully in contact with them. Now, what contact is this that I'm talking about? 
We, we do not go to, we don't know them. For example, I'm, I'm giving um, an example here um, of elders who are buried in the homestead or close to the homestead. Um, their spirits are believed to be actively present around the places. Uh oh, they might now starting to say things. It is not un uncommon to hear them how we actively communicate to them, how we actively communicate to them. Um, for example, before I talk to my, my great grandmother's story, um, when we have a piece like a piece like the parents and then we have a like that, delivered by father here, or when we have weddings, um, when we serve food for Omalobu, we have a form from Liga, it must be full, and the first cup to be served should be served in a manner that it overflows and it not overflow signifies that we are saying share in our feasting, share in our event, and we acknowledge that you are not dead, you are truly an actively present with us. And if you don't do that, the elders around you remind you, or they will that you are fully uninformed and perfectly able to proceed. That's what a nice picture. For example, um, uh, my parents' house is in a field that belongs to my great grandmother, my father's grandmother. So um, I have not met Kukutachia, that's the name of my great grandmother. Um, but she, we were told, I assure you, there is no gravestone, there is no sign of the book. We were told and shown that here is where Kuku is made to rest. And it's in the fields where there is no gravestone. No called big mountain. Now, um, when we went in the field, or when we pass by, walk past, we were told and instructed to acknowledge her presence in that area. You shall never pass without saying, Granny, we are passing by. No, you are here. Your spirit is here. Or um, when you, you cultivate around that area, you don't just go there, and not just any child who doesn't have a sense of what is happening goes and work around that area. And the, 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 what scared us a little as small children is that that, that woman is next to Osheke, where we fetch water. Yes. Now, if you have to go fetch water alone, and we are told who laid there, we would uh, prefer to go somewhere else to fetch what is then go there alone because what is for good? I'll tell you. As children, you know, we make conclusions and our understanding is limited. But today, we are privileged as we grow to understand that we're not talking about the physical body of Kuku which is laid. The other one is God, that we, we dig. There might be nothing, but you think about the spiritual communion that we have with those that we hold dear. Interest, what is interesting is that most of us never met this uh, person, uh, and, and, and I'm not even going to go into the story that's in about. Um, she, she as, as I say, yes, yes. she is one of those that are all over during celebrations such as weddings and and, 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 and 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 all that. It is no disregard of Christianity when you hear our Buddhist kuku penduk penduk during their celebrations. For example, my father is late. When we have weddings and, you know, jolly celebrations at home, 
is when we, especially we go to church and when we enter the homestead, immediately you hear people from all sides imploring the presence of my dad, that his spirit be joyful with us. And when, when it, 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 just like when people criticize our being believers in Christ, um, I, I see it similar uh, because um, even the day before yesterday, um, I was talking to a colleague who said, but what, what do we get from believing? Nowadays, you know, church is, it's fine, but uh, I will hold on because um, it's all okay for me. If I believe in Christ, if I read the Bible, I always get peace, consolation. I always believe that my prayers are heard and therefore I will succeed, I will not fail, I will not fall. But if I don't believe, I assure you, I don't know what will happen to me. And for that, even if you say that for heaven, that's what I am not losing anything. But for you, where do you get your peace, your consolation, your assurance? And it's the same. As soon as you hear Paul say, you know, but don't know when they come in that place, you feel like there is no here with us. So strong. And therefore, um, when um, this has a deep rooted meaning and it gives um, a, 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 a sense of spiritual connectedness to our uncanonized saints. Our, our dead who lived lives that please God. Some have died before the arrival of Christianity. Some have died without um, anyone really following up on their lives and so forth. I, for one, therefore got better to understand the role of the saints without struggle because this concept is very close to my cultural belief and relation with my ancestors. Positivists may argue that ancestors' veneration can be a preparation for the fullness of evangelization. Looking at what I narrated, you may agree or disagree with that quote. Ancestors, therefore, are respected and recognized by those who belong to their clans or clan lines or totem or families. And this is what differentiates the two. Saints are believed in and venerated by all, regardless of their biological relations. And I'm just so proud of you to say, not only regardless of their biological relations, but also um, we say the Catholic Church canonizes saints. But even those that do not respect, that do not like Catholics, also have a certain degree of faith and belief and respect for our saints. Because our saints do not say, you are not Catholic, I'm not going to pray for you, I'm not going to show faith to you, I'm not going to intercede for you. And I believe if they are truthful, there are those times that these saints showed themselves to them through intercession and through evidence that can be provided and they could really say um, our saints are real. Ancestors are not idols. Ancestors are not worshipped. Ancestors are not gods. Ancestors are not unknown dangerous spirits. They are our departed brothers and sisters whom we loved in this life and we continue to appreciate in the life hereafter. And sisters too are seen as mediators between humankind and God, that highest only born and being, that we hear about. Saints and ancestors may have a few resemblances, such as I mean, I want to stress that. I believe it's safe to say. Um, and saints and ancestors are our departed brothers and sisters, those who are physically no longer with us. Those that we believe that 
the, uh, where they are going to, we too shall go. Um, they are those who, even in their peaceful absence, we believe that the special interest in our well-being, uh, a being present to and with us, they intercede for us constantly. Ancestors are believed to be the place. There has not been processes undertaken to prove that they are worth to be as such. But saints are canonized by the church and therefore the is through and there has been processes undertaken. Gathered in one place, therefore, without exaggeration of looking down upon any, the mysticism in the concepts of ancestors and saints makes powerful the faithful and the connection between the living and the spiritual world. That's the after. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Teresa, for this lengthy touching, insightful, informative, educating talk. Please, let's give you another round of applause. <laughs> now, having touched and heard about the saints and the ancestors, we need to understand how the culture contributes towards Christianity. And I believe that there is power in believing in one's cultural songs because they point towards our healthy identity. Our next speaker is an equally devout Christian and a cultured young man. He was born and raised in Okalongo village in Omsati region. <laughs> he holds a bachelor degree in theology and he strongly believes in a Shlango proverbs such as Kulaumone, which translates to living is knowledge or living is, you know, the professors and the doctors like who will do a better translation. He lives two famous images that he learned from his father. Hamunja Kulanahe, Mbabi Abutukanaina, Kairu Ukona, Okoshiba Ndasha Shoguru. He actually believes that every Thursday is peculiar to the Ambaja and Oshwambo tribe. Hence the notion, a tinel of Ambaja, he firmly believes, as an African man, that culture and Christianity are like two wings which are equally important and should be treated with mutual respect and dignity. I would therefore like to call upon our speaker to come and provide some highlights on the contribution of culture towards Christianity. Mr. Jerome.
your credit at Bishop Bonus Nashenda of the Archdiocese of Bedlam in Absentia, the Vicar General of the Archdiocese of Bedlam, Vietnam's Manager Afunde in Absentia, the Rector of the St. Charles World and Major Seminary, Reverend Dr. Afada Daiju Italian, the staff members of the St. Charles World and Major Seminary, fellow presenters, permit me to acknowledge the presence of one who has already presented, Dr. Theresia Nepolo, I recognize you. Permit me to acknowledge the presence of the seminarians who has prepared this history in the remarkable day as far as seminar presentation are concerned. Dear participants, brothers and sisters, who have sacrificed your busy schedule to come and be part of this great historic day. Um, as is pointed out by Iconio, that wisdom is not nobody's monopoly. I do not claim to have a monopoly of wisdom, but rather to share with you the knowledge based on the topic that is entrusted to me, titled The Contribution of Culture Towards Christianity. In order to be faithful to my subject, I would like to share with you the following six points. Definition of culture that we are going to look at in the context of Africa. The second point is the contribution of culture towards Christianity in the African continent. The third point the contribution of culture towards liturgical celebration. And the fourth one, Ubuntu, and its cultural contribution towards Christianity. And the fifth, Namibia as a Christian nation. And the last one, we are going to look at contemporary challenges facing culture and the Christianity and thereby drawing a conclusion. The very first point, definition of culture within the African context. Most of us would have listened to powerful speeches such as that of Professor Joseph Dishon, most of his presentations he begins by saying, Ask in Tabano culture or ask in the Bukushu. And they will explain and connect anything to Tabano cultures or way of life. In the same manner, the eloquent speaker, such as Professor Patrick Lodge of Channel Moon, will never say something in battle without mentioning that. Professor Degeo defines culture as a way of life of the members of a society or groups within a society. This includes how they dress, their marriage customs and family life, their patterns of work, religious ceremonies and religious pursuits. The girl points out that no culture could exist without society. 
Christianity cannot exist without culture. It consists of values that members of a given group hold and the norms they follow. For instance, monogamy. Culture is also defined as that which is related to the higher things of the mind, such as literature, music, and painting. The contribution of culture towards Christianity in the African continent, where we are going to look at some of the data or statistics. According to Saizadin, Christianity is the major religion in numerous African countries. He argues that, as of 2023, around 96% of the population of Zambia are Christian, representing the highest percentage on the continent. Socialists and Rwanda followed with roughly 95% and 94% of the population being Christian, respectively. While these countries present the highest percentages, Christianity was also predominantly prevalent in many other African nations. For instance, in South Africa, Christianity was the religion of nearly 80% of the people, while the share corresponded to 71% in Ghana. So statistics are necessary, as it points out to say that when missionaries came to the African continent, they met culture, and the culture welcomed Christianity. The great culture of Nelson Mandela in South Africa welcomes it. The great culture of Albert Mutuli welcomes it. The great culture of Oliver Campo welcomes it. There's a great culture of Desmond Tutu welcomes it. And it did not stop there. So culture welcomes Christianity, especially in this land of the great Nani. So the great culture of Self-sufficient Mioma welcomes it. The great culture of Archbishop Bonifacius Maushiku welcomes it. The great culture of Archbishop Dipolis in Ukutina Senda welcomes it. The great culture of Self-sufficient Mioma welcomes it. The great culture of Harman and Dimba Peiboya Peibo welcomes it. And it did not stop there. So, great culture in Angola also welcomes Christianity. So, the great culture of Augustine Nato welcomes Christianity. The great culture of Jonas Mandeo Sabindi welcomes it. And it should not stop there. Christianity was welcomed in the great culture of Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. In the great culture of Patrick Emilio Mumba, Isaiah Kasumbu Kalosa, welcome. The great culture of Joseph Desire Mokuntu Sesenseko, Mokunpen Batsapa, welcome. And it did not stop there. Christianity was welcome in those great cultures in Nigeria. The great cultures of Namdi, Atikwe, Abubakar Kasawa, Balewa, Sam Hamad, Melo, Sotjalo, Sotjalo. And it did not stop there. He was welcomed in those great cultures of Malawi, the Swatin, the Sulu, and also in the eastern part of Africa, we talk about Tanzania, the great culture of Jewish Kambarak and Yerel. It proceeded that side of the eastern part of uh, Africa, we talk about Kenya, it went up to Maghreb, Kenya in the central Africa of the uh, of Central African uh, continent. It went that side of Maghreb and then also North Africa as well as Ecuador. So that is to show that Christianity, when it came in this great continent, was welcomed by the culture. The contribution of, towards, uh, of culture towards Christianity. 
So when we talk about culture, we are saying culture is one of the most important aspects that is beautifully beautified by the culture of celebration. In this entire culture of celebration, we see an integration of unique cultural elements, such as cultural attacks with cultural songs being integrated either in processional songs or assembly or entrance procession, Bible procession, etc. The contribution of culture towards Christianity plays a very strong, significant, and vital role, thus creating in people's hearts and minds a sense of belonging and ownership. This means with culture, Christian liturgy is beautified and it becomes personal. It creates cultural identity, purposes, and belonging. Culture can influence theological interpretations and the development of Christian doctrine. Culture values, perspectives, and social norms can shape how believers understand and apply the biblical teachings in light of scriptural principles and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Culture influences the way Christian worship and expresses their faith. Different cultures have different, have different unique forms of worship. Talk about liturgy, music, art, and architecture, reflecting the traditions and aesthetics. Cultural expressions in worship can enhance the spiritual experience, foster community, and provide a sense of identity for believers. We look at Ubuntu and its cultural contribution towards Christianity. Ubuntu means human characteristics of generosity, consideration, and humanness towards others in the community. It is a practice unique to African way of life, which is carefully integrated into Christianity, and it has contributed immensely to the growth and development of Christianity and the propagation of faith. That's why like when the wise men recognized that Jesus Christ was a king, out of respect, they brought him gifts befitting a king, such as gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Similarly, African culture offers gifts during offering procession. So, be in the context of liturgical celebration of sacraments such as Christmas, Eucharist, Confirmation, etc., gifts are offered in African cultural style, manifesting our cultural identity, such as the new harvest, or when we grow the new harvest church. So, culture is us, we are saying culture, Christianity is ours. So, when Christianity comes into your culture, you either accept it or reject it. Joining the religious life of this group implies cultural acceptance of Christianity. Majority of Namibia implies nearly an accepted Christianity, and this includes conversion of the Limba tribe, who some of them have gradually accepted Christianity. This means you can't just change a culture overnight. Culture is life. <laughs> People have lived and stayed in this culture, so we can't change it just like that. That is why we need to use culture in order for us to change things. For culture to accept Christianity, the words of Francis of Assisi reminds us, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words and not talk. Implicit in this saying is the understanding that often the most powerful sermons are unspoken. When we have integrity and live consistently by our standards, people notice. When we have changed joy and happiness, they notice even more. We look at the Namibian context as a Christian nation. The church statistics in the government, demographic, and the health safety of 2013 confirms that approximately 97% of the Namibian population is Christian. Chapter 1 points out that the purpose of statistics is to 
to help us and, uh, on, conduct research, evaluate outcomes, develop critical thinking, and make informed decisions. These statistical figures confirm that Namibia's different ethno linguistic cultures have accepted Christianity. This means brothers and sisters, culture and Christianity are like brothers and sisters. We need each other to benefit from each other and to grow on the way. It is self evident that the cultural and the Christian values are compatible with each other. The traditional way of evangelization is being carried by the local locals and as a result of advancing values that proceed from culture, the seed of Christianity is no doubt in Namibia being spearheaded by the church long a major seminar, the American Industrial and Theological Seminar, Paulino, and the Namibia Evangelical Theological Seminar and others. These are institutions that are acknowledged by the government of the Republic of Namibia through the Namibian Qualification Authority and the Namibia Council of Higher Education to let the way to plan it and for the propagation of faith through evangelization. The results of cultures accepting the challenge show that we have a number of indigenous religious sisters, brothers and indigenous local priests actively working in various fields, such as education, health, etc. So, Namibia manifests that it is truly a mission to nation. Well, why do we call Namibia a Christian nation? We have accepted to say our culture can build education, economy, politics, faith, and religion. In the sociology of religion, the error argues that culture can be learned, can be studied, and created. Number two. A person must have a brief education which emanates from culture. A person must be able to excel and to live with other people because the culture with the person which a person comes from has evolved in him. What are some of the contemporary challenges facing culture and Christianity in our time? There are many contemporary challenges facing our cultures and Christianity across the African continent. One of these challenges is the assuming of unregulated churches operating anywhere, anyhow, now. And in Rwanda, with the argues, President Pope Kagame points out that pastors and prophets must have a theological degree from an accredited institution. The Pope of Kagame. I have closed down over 6,000 churches and the mosques in my country, and then I now demand a degree in theology for every religious people. End of the poem. <laughs> <laughs> in Namibia, we also have our own challenges. A showing of churches with pastors operating in academic qualifications from recognized and accredited institutions under the pages of, of the Constitution. Passion killing and gay marriage are equal some of the challenges facing our Namibian culture. But we can critically rise from the level of reflection to conscious to the level of critical in depth thinking by questioning as to what can cultures contribute to charity in, in, in overcoming such contemporary challenges. The questioner questions the question. <laughs> <laughs> Passion killing our culture. It's bestiality in our culture. Men in Tohangwena having sexual intercourse with donkeys. According to them, source, they are not <laughs> Senior traditional counselor for the community district in the Okoyama traditional authority, the late Ajino Ishoba in Mabuka. And I told you, this thing, the Christianity, is against our culture and the Christianity. Can your culture or my culture 
accept this, some of this uh, uh, contemporary practices. It really integrates them with sarcasm. We have the moral authority to step in to speak against such practices. Given the fact that our forefathers spoke to defend our culture, to protect the intention to protect our integrity. Culture makes us strong and makes us to say yes or no to foreign things that are incompatible with our culture. We better argue to say, culture can influence this and ethical in the moral perspectives in some practices. Cultural values, norms, and the ethical frameworks shape how believers address social issues, make ethical decisions, and engage the world. However, Christians are called to present the, the compatibility of culture, cultural values with biblical principles and to prioritize the teachings of Christ. In conclusion, ultimately, the relationship between culture and Christianity is dynamic in this program. Christianity can both influence and be influenced by culture. It is important for believers to critically engage in their cultural context, discerning the compatibility of cultural values with biblical truth, and striving to live out their faith in a way that glorifies God and the best is the power of the gospel. Culture has been the cornerstone for us to accept Christianity. Yes, we are cornerstone for us to accept other people. Christianity came to meet culture and they became not enemies but friends. In their mutual friendship, they have diamonds that are in the best interest of human civilization and human salvation. Christianity was is this true friend of cultures, and this is true to culture as well. Just like the word made flesh and it dwelt among us. Christianity came and it dwelt amongst African culture. And the seminary aims to help the world incarnate in this particular cultural, social, and political context of this great nation. I'm therefore submitting to words that contribution of culture towards Christianity should reaffirm the importance of family and its original true definition of marriage. And submitting to us that the biblical courts between culture and Christianity support the teachings of caste canopy. And submitting to us that just like in the past, African culture needs originality to be strengthened and yes consortium. And submitting to us that just like Rwanda, religious leaders possess a great theological qualification to practice their faith. <laughs> I'm submitting to us that as a culture continues to allow Christianity to fill its theological evangelization, the proclamation of good news to advocate eternal value, promote the discouraged evil that are wandering to African cultural values such as sodomy, incest, fashion killing or gender-based violence, gay marriage, and bestiality. In this, thank you very much. I want to bless Africa, I want to bless Namibia, I want to bless our culture, and I bless the children. <laughs>
culture is us and Christianity is ours. <laughs> um, I want you to get that even Jesus himself was influenced by the society in which he lived. He would use parables such as the shepherd of the flock. Um, you know, he would use technologies that would make sense to the people he was addressing. And these images were used, and they say carry a similar orientation <laughs> into the sides. As we look through the cultural exploring and trying to see how is culture related to Christianity, I would like to introduce our next speaker, who will also be our last speaker for the day, who will be talking to us and explaining the meeting point of culture in Christianity. He was born and raised in a village called Omega in the Sato region. He was an enthusiastic young man, an exceptional student who advocated for educational strength. He finished his special education in obtaining the Bachelor of Degree in Theology at St. Joseph's Theological Institute, Sedara, and St. He was ordained as an obrate priest in October 2007. He advanced in his studies and obtained a licentiate in theology and spiritual theology at the Gregorian Pontifical University in Rome. He worked in various parishes within the Archdiocese as well as in the Vicariate of the Virgin. He has a, a special interest in history and he conducts researches in social justice. Well versed in the field of culture and Christianity, he will then enlighten us on the interconnectedness of culture and Christianity. So ladies and gentlemen, please let us welcome Reverend Father Matthias Deuchua Chipiwana. Stage. Uh, thank you very much, um, Sister Margarita. May I greet you all? Um, the Hector Seminary. Dear fathers, dear sisters, brother seminarians, offices, and other young people in the mission, and everybody else in attendance. Our task, our task is therefore to look at uh, the meeting point uh, between culture and uh, uh, Christianity. What is the meeting point or point of convergence? An attempt to answer these questions will help to discuss the place of culture and the structure of Christianity. The positive and negative role of culture this presentation looks at Christianity and culture in general, but with more emphasis on Christianity and African culture, in particular in the light of Ethiopia. Just at the very beginning, just to clarify uh, terms, 
culture and the uh, Christianity as per se. Uh, my friend uh, John Beatty also helped me uh, to familiarize myself with this uh, concept. Like culture, within this presentation, culture is understood as the complex whole, which includes knowledge, beliefs, arts, uh, morals, laws, customs, and any other capacities acquired by a human being as a member of society. So it justifies that culture has a biblical origin where the command in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, said to be divine, or to the divine command that gave credence to the origin of human culture. Here God created male and female in his own likeness, image and likeness, with human faculties, like racial, moral, and spiritual, and uh, gives them command of procreation. On the other hand, Christianity, within this presentation, is understood as the religion derived from the teachings of Jesus Christ as professed historically by the major uh, religions of the world or uh, major church lines like Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestants. The term Roman Catholic, therefore, is used to designate Christians who have alliance to the, to the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, who is believed to derive his supreme authority from the Apostle Peter as Vicar of Christ. So those concepts will guide us as we go along. When we talk of Christianity and uh, culture and Christianity in the original context, when we talk of Christianity and culture, we recall that Christianity has its own beginnings rooted in culture. Jesus Christ was born in a particular culture, the Jewish culture, where he was also brought up. Again, Jesus experienced the influence of Greek culture, even though he was a Jew by birth. We can observe, we can observe from the names of some of his friends, which were Greek, uh, Greek in form. For example, his friend Lazarus for Eliazar. It is evident that the followers of Jesus, who wrote the New Testament in Greek, this was because Greek was and the common language of the Jews after they were dispensed. Also, Christo, as Jesus was called, was a Greek word for Christ, which means the anointed one. Although Jesus had his own culture, he was also open to other cultures. When the church in the West identified itself with the Roman Empire. Rome had already imposed its own culture on Europe. Thus, when Emperor Constantine became a, Christ, a Christian in the first century, uh, Christianity adopted uh, Western culture as an ideal culture which was to be taught and preached along with the gospel. That's why we see a lot of Western cultures in our communities, be it in Africa, or Asia, or America, we just began there. Non-Western cultures had to pass the text, the process of assimilation, whether you can find some similarities with these uh, Christian cultures, transformation and the 
uh, contradiction and objections. However, already in the, uh, the 1659, the convocation for the propagation of faith, and now it's called the Gospel for Evangelization, which was sending missionaries for the possible for the missions and evangelization across the world, instructed some European missionaries, for example, not to take their countries where they are going to evangelize. For example, when the French missionaries came, or the, the Spanish missionaries came to Africa or Asia as well, or Italian missionaries. Those went to China, India, or Africa, media included, but to rather bring the faith, the faith there. The, the point for the propaganda today, as it was called, was that the encounter of human beings in view of Christian faith and cultures should embrace better communication and guide. But when we not embed the propagation of faith, trying also to propagate faith and culture. Then dialogue that we have pointed out as a meeting point of culture in Christianity, the, the propaganda today holds the process of the encounter of the gospel and culture is an analogical to the Incarceration debate. We tell it again, we have had John Paul II um, talking about the incarnation, uh, Jesus born into flesh, that also culture, or rather Christianity will penetrate in culture and they give birth to, to something new which is upholding a better, a better life. Jesus as Logos. Logos, this is a Greek word, it means um, word, took on a concrete human nature, and the concrete human being was a revelation from God. So, should, you, should be a message to be incarnated in heaven, in the new church. Um, this Jesus, the logo, now had to be also incarcerated, or rather incarnated in each culture. You know, um, if you can see this, see, this is culture is just going in, in different directions. Our cultures, Asian cultures, African cultures. Um, American cultures, you name it all. These cultures, each one is just going in its own direction without control. And then, when something is just going in any direction, what happens? You either crash, you collide it, or it bypass you. Should these cultures just bypass the gospel? And so, uh, this was the task of the church. Like uh, the, the last presenter spoke about uh, and culture, or spoke about culture and Christianity as brothers. So, indeed, let it be. If your brother is going astray, you have to protect your brother. So now Christianity came just as a revelation to enlighten, to enlighten these cultures. So that at least there's something related. The culture and the Christianity are two structures or two structures in dialogue. It is here that the two realities really contain a meeting point to iron out the common ground and the differences. When there is a dialogue, then the two structures, culture and the Christianity, could distinguish between what is religious and what is profit, 
in case of ancestral revelation or worship. Not all missionary practices were negative. It is not denied that they were or it is not uh, denied that there were enough cultural traditional elements which challenged by the Christian gospel. Thus, uh, the missionaries also played an important role to safeguard Africans from some dangerous cultural practices which the society accepted. Nobody would, for example, commit the traditional whereby a woman was subjected to an inhuman treatment for four weeks without bathing after the burial of her husband. Or a 15-year-old girl would be often married off as it used to happen in the Ambo culture. So, it is easy to speak of the African culture, meeting Christian cultures in the atmosphere of dialogue, mutual tolerance, and the search for those common elements that reinforce the values embodied in each culture and practices. In cases of similarity, the Christian gospel hardly finds it difficult to penetrate into the heart of the complex uh, because cultural values seem to be softened the heart of the complex ahead of the gospel. A good example is a culture which, uh, which promotes and encourages monogamy. As a, a missionary, you go to a, a nation, a community, an area where they already believe in, in what God. It's easier for you as a missionary to preach to them about God of Abraham, God of Israel. But uh, if you find polytheism where they believe in many gods, it will be difficult for you to bring them to believe in God of Abraham. For they believe in God of fire, God of water, God of good harvest, God of mountains, and so forth. And then it will be a, 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 a lot of, of work. Um, so, in such above instances, culture does help people to easily live in those similar tradition, traditions and beliefs and practices between cultural adopting concepts and the uh, and the Christian teaching. Just to go to now, because of the dialogue, the dialogue that is the, the culture and Christianity have to discuss. Let us just move to inculturation to say um, the dialogue, the dialogue between culture and descent gave birth to inculturation just out of mutual respect which it addressed the Christian experience of local church in its own, own culture, in its own people. The, the inculturation here is the term that Catholic leaders and theologians have used in recent decades to denote the process of engagement between Christian gospel and a particular culture. Thus, it has become theological associated with John Paul II's strategy to new evangelization. Uh, in his book, Ecclesia in Africa, where he emphasized the church as a family, or rather, yes, the church as a family. We in Africa, mostly we know the importance of the family structure in our service. It's easier for us to preach to the people the church as a family with the African societies because they live in families and they they would uh, therefore live their Christian life uh, as, a, as, a, as a family of, of Christ. And also the Jesuit theologian Carl Rani in his theological interpretation of Vatican II, like uh, the church in the modern world, how 
the more the more she can understand Christianity to interact with the culture. So our theological task must be cautious of the influence of the cultural agenda and the political ideology. We, we have heard the previous presentations. The, the magisterium established for the official teaching of the church, established some, some criteria of infatuation to eliminate abuse and unfriendly elements with the gospel. When we are trying to facilitate the dialogue between Christians and culture, that not everything will just be brought to Christianity liturgy. The wrong establishment of some criteria, like the cultural practice should not contradict the gospel message. Whatever we are taking from our culture into, into the church, into Christianity, should not contradict, should not contradict the gospel. The, the gospel says love one another. So we have to promote love. And uh, if we find uh, some elements of in culture which are promoting hate and division, those ones cannot be uh, brought to, uh, to liturgy or to Christianity. And the second thing, the practice to be encouraged to be encouraged should be able to, to benefit the investor church. Should be able to, to benefit the investor church. For example, Africa and Namibia names for baptism should not be strange or foreign to Christian religion, which don't encourage or promote love, peace, or unity, example of hatred. You cannot baptize somebody hatred or division. <laughs> or Mapoda. Baptizing somebody, this, is, this name is a bit strange, Christian religion. Or Kavulina. You baptize somebody Kavulina. Can you not talk about this Kavulina church? So, so the, the child ends up to help it, as the name suggests, to be disobedient. So the child will be disobedient. But I recommend names of the saints. The church is still encouraging us to also keep uh, names of the saints to our children and also to African names which are promoting unity. Like Peter, Paul, John, Leticia, Anastasia, and the other African names like Washir, Nochihere, Nerao, Inoshitanyama, Smaneka, Haushiku, Nekabayo, Haibura, Mosemedi, Nisitsona, and so forth. Now, I want to share with you briefly some ideas between the African cultures and Christian faith. When we look at the history of Christianity in Namibia, we see that Christianity has been here for more than 100 years. Since 1896, in the case of the Catholic Church, already we celebrated the century in 1996 when we celebrated 100 years. When the church was founded, Christianity came into contact with Namibian people and they are catch already long back. Uh, Tia explained how this interaction happened. The Bible is now written in many Namibian languages so that people can read and understand the scripture in the language of their cultures. Many music instruments which appear in of Namibian culture have been brought into the, into the instrument of praising God. Traditional drums, I see some, some drums here, like Ungoma, this traditional drums by the Ambo, or Awambo people, the Kabango people, and the Shekas. You see people using this uh, traditional Shekas uh, in, in, uh, in church. Konama stuff, sometimes you see. If you go to Kuniha's meetings, you see people also performing this and, uh, and others. So, um, just to, to, to finalize in conclusion, we uh, uh, ran out of time. Okay. Now, even this incarcerated, it faces some 
some challenges. Uh, like for example, se secretism. Secretism, when people live a double standard, they are in Christianity, they are in culture. You, you see or you observe at times during the day of Sundays they are in church. But at times they are consulting this tradition times for culture. Good luck and the and other things. This is, this is a challenge. But some people feel that they are big people in this country. And it's not that person. Uh, they are so now, because of some of those challenges, we have to know that Christianity is coming to put the equation as a big since it's a powerful culture. Now, because African culture has been included, because it's the beginning of this And to conclude, the dialogue between cultures is a conclusion. In conclusion, the dialogue between culture and Christianity has brought much fruits. Reformation and cultural change. We need a coherent and a classic. Brother Katia was talking about the ideas that the culture is rather, rather Christian and independent change. But I tell you, it began like that. Even among the Zulu in South Africa, when Father President Joseph Gerhardt, but the Tibet and others, those French missionaries, when they come there, people could not accept Christianity. They left Zulu land and got to accept it. But now we have many priests, religious sisters, even in Kabila, from Kazuna So don't be surprised, after some decades, you will see an archbishop coming from the Hippolyto. No, we are still, the church, Christianity, still dialoguing with those churches so that they come. Uh, they come at peace with the Christianity. And so, Christianity and the culture are not identical. They are not the same, though they enrich each other. Christianity being the religion of Jesus Christ remains superior and above all cultures. However, it needs to be deeply rooted in the African soil, in particular in Namibia, Evangelization and dialogue and inculturation have all been important terms for both a place in Africa by John Paul II and the African Moons by Benedict the Sixteenth. There is a deep, or there is a need to a deep catechism, priests as pastors of souls and the collaborators as bishops are advised and encouraged to grow in their knowledge of catechism, documents of magisterium and social teaching. The, the absence of incarceration is also an obstacle to effective evangelization. Even the seminarians, when you read the seminary, implement some of the incarceration practices um, to bring them out in your liturgy and so forth. And uh, I thank you. There are also some uh, references that are used. Uh, we get some of the ideas from the writers, African literature, and the uh, African theologians.
to understand the world in which we live in. I want to believe that people without the knowledge of their past history, their origin and their culture are like a tree without roots. However, this does not mean that we will be defined by the influences of culture forever. We need to press beyond cultural influences and come to know Jesus personally, as it was highlighted by all the speakers, bringing the interconnectedness between culture and Christianity. We need to understand Jesus' teaching and live in a way that is honorable to him. Now, although we are influenced by different factors and backgrounds, we need to listen to Jesus. And this is the point I want to draw. Jesus needs to help us to understand our cultures. And the culture should help us to understand our Christian faith in a more solid and beautiful way. I'm trying to draw you to an attention that as we go into a little bit of discussions, let us not forget that Christianity is more superior than our cultures. I give the floor to the MC so that it gives us to the next time. Thank you to all the speakers for sharing valuable insights and knowledge. Your presentation was truly inspiring and informative. So why not with our program of Kurken Yanche Cultural Things Academy in Production? Felt like they did not give us enough. As for them, it was merely the beginning. And so they would like to give us their actual performance. So, my dear brothers and sisters, we are waiting for you.
you find mass formula in the Chibango, the Chiherero, in the Maranama of Kats. Because the missionaries, when they go to the farms, this to came to find the Kabango speaking people. Tomorrow, when you go there, you find the Herero speaking people. That's why they compose those books, so that they just reflect the mass. If you have a lot of people who have so the, the, the missionaries can, can do their best, just be patient with them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, it is related to your question. I would like to take some wisdom from Nampi and Sikuwe in the back of Kaskawa and Leo. These are very influential thinkers in Nigeria. And they are saying for us to create a better society. It requires a collective responsibility. As it were in those words, in acts to say, this responsibility is not cannot only be for cannot only be carried out for one particular institution or its people. And therefore, when we speak about the ancestors, the name law is proper. I was not even going to go to the and I'll show you one video But I believe in the spiritual realm, when you call the ancestors, by virtue of being, finding favor with the great, greater spirits in their world, they will act. But those that are not, will definitely not be able to happen to them. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Sorry. Time is not to be on our side. Please try to be brief. Please respond and we will speak in our questions. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Celine. Um, I would like to first thank you for the presentation. We may answer some of the questions that I have. Uh, but I found myself not, I didn't hear the whole, um, when culture negates Christianity, how do we take that? Um, that comes up, uh, it's a question that was asked to me um, by a colleague, who believes in this culture where deities are worshipped, but he also believes that he's a Christian. Now, as a Christian, we know that we have one God that we worship. So how do we answer a question where a person in that um, area says, I'm a Christian, but I still believe that I should follow my culture where deities are worshipped. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the matter, thank you so much. Oh, okay, thank you. I have two questions. It's not just right to be a speak, uh, special speaker, but since they are all scholars, they can assist each other. Precisely in Namibia, I think only little is done to incorporate culture and Christianity. So what do you think the church, not the church in general, but precisely the hierarchy should do to make culture really part of Christians, since currently Christianity is seen as a separate entity, so is uh, Christianity. The second one is, with the adoption of Christianity, don't you think we have adopted other people's culture? Uh, and the first one is going to Mr. Jerome Atea. 
And that as Christians, we believe that God created the world and He said that it is good. And even after the fall of man, much of his goodness, of his goodness, such as beauty and truth and human dignity, remains. What is good in our culture that we can promote, protect, and celebrate? That is the question. And the second question is about the saints and the, and the ancestors. Uh, are they same being the same because they are doing the same function or they are different? Or maybe in Christianity we are saying saints and in our culture we are saying ancestors. Knowledge of my workplace. I'm a language person, 
and from nowhere I was given the motto of indigenous knowledge and conflict management, specifically in Namibia and Africa. I, 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 in, in the Catholic Church, I always found space, and especially that I love singing, believe my words in faint and sincere, to compose songs that are totally cultural. Melodies, songs like and, and the church around us and it gives us space to be who we are in its space. So therefore, uh, we need therefore to define how much more, what is more, and how best can the church do more to uh, enculturate. It's only the Catholic Church that speaks um, about enculturation. And as we'll say, look at them. They say the Christians, but we know how far we are allowed to go as a group of believers. Of course, um, ancestors are ancestors, saints are saints. Saints are canonized, ancestors are believed. We just believe that they are in a better place and they have the ability to be, communicate for us and intercede for us. They do not, they do not the same at all. The processes that are undertaken. In fact, with ancestors, you don't take the undertaken process. We have the process of canonization for our saints, but for our ancestors, you are guided, you are appointed to, and then you will take it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me also say something. Uh, I would like to take the questions where Carabella asked if we are not adapting other people's culture. Uh, most of the times, some cultures are good, some are bad. So when there is a culture we use, we, use, we need to check if the culture we are taking is it good. Don't be this says whenever we are adapting the culture, let us say only what is good, for example. When you are going to a near place, you will find them having their own cultures. So for you to grow, to make grow their, your culture and your community, you can take what is good for yourself from that people and come away and teach your culture. Then I come to the question where they were asking about sisters if they are all, everyone who dies is your So, I just want to touch it there. A few days before my father passed away, we had a ceremony home, and eventually my elder brother was sick. Then we had to burn the incense, the traditional incense. Then my father says, now suddenly you take it, you are going to burn it. But make sure that whoever you are invoking as an ancestor from the impossible is a good person. For example, if you someone who was a witch, you will have a best half. So make sure that the person you are invoking is someone who has good in the So not everyone who dies becomes an ancestor for the old ancestor. I just want to comment a bit about the, the sister there who, who spoke of worshipping the ancestors. But you don't worship the ancestors, you worship God. And the you can, uh, you can uh, venerate the good ancestors and you can pray for them. But you don't worship them. Otherwise, they, they, they take the place of God. Um, and, uh, and also, um, what can the, the Hamon do or the hierarchy do to incorporate culture into church? This is what I was mentioning. Those two, uh, the church has established the doctrine of incarceration. When we are, we are borrowing certain aspects from culture and 
to frame what is the criteria should guide us so that we do not go wrong. Um, that what we are trying to inculcate, to bring into faith, should not contradict the message of the gospel. And also, what we are trying to inculcate should, should benefit the universal church. It should, it should not be something which is strange or foreign to the Christian religion. This is what I have been pleased to say. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I need to apologize because you can all overtake my questions. So please, if you have a question, kindly jot them down. You can always see the presenters some other times. Now, I want to believe that this thing was the memorable one. This talk has been um, influential, mind-opening, educative. I just would like to render my special word of gratitude to the speakers. Please don't take me wrong. I'm not the one rendering the word of thanks. I just want to thank them for the formative and educative and influential talk that they have presented today. I hope that this information sharing session will impact or has already impacted us all positively. I thank you so much for your time and I remain humble. I would like to invite the Reverend uh, John Jacob. <laughs> or the team of study and the team of student in the St. Charles Mohammed Seminary. And you give us a concluding remark. <laughs> Without culture, 
we are no longer human beings because the first the color the face everything come in the form of as we have heard from these speakers of the day when the gospel reaches the people where they are they respond to that gospel in the church in a new place the song will be a new song and some song unwritten melody that really touches all of us so from this introductory bits let me go to the very special message of the key not speaker in absentia lucia number 2 and presented by father anto james and he had mentioned very important areas like prayer pardon passage rights Agus of the first fruits, tabus involving God in everything, sickness, serving guests, and ancestral spirits, and its resemblance to the Holy Spirit power on the Christian way of life, how to live and behave in a society, and in all this he put forward this idea that. it has a significant influence in our christian way of life at the end of the presentation he called our attention that we are having this culture and christianity are great two pillars in our life and without these two pillars we cannot be claimed as christians and also these two would contribute in the art for the society's moral life civic life and also its development then we find our presenter sanere yokosi who was born in africa we call this man a wonderful person but he had i think he had contributed a lot by telling that god is not a stranger in africa and in that particular statement He had concluded everything because by nature in Africa God is there and in every breath of life God is present. So I think there is nothing to tell that there is a reality, the Almighty reality that is something new because it is everywhere present and also is constant. Then we come to the presentation of Dr. Teresa. She was trying her best to present. the ancestors role and the same role in one's life we need to recognize appreciate and also welcome this and this ancestors is not worship some days people will be saying ancestors worship nothing at all if i am right it is not worshiping ancestors instead we appreciate their power in the life of the people who are really in touch with this people And the saints really are our models to imitate Christ, who has really lived like us in their own life. One of the crosses asked in the class, saints, why are they saints? The answer would be, they are humans like us, but they have really lived out the gospel passage or messages here on earth, and they are the best models to imitate Christ. So thank you very much. and then we have dr kathaya who has made the presentation and the title the contribution of culture to its society there we find culture as a way of life and also a way of helping us to come more to the society and this cultural influence really helping us have an impact on all of us because christianity as a major religion in numerous african countries with this data he has really made us to think that this african continent is blessed with the gospel message and also its values and then we find father matias presentation meeting point the culture and christianity then he has mentioned about christianity has the beginning rooted in a culture jesus was born in a culture he was a cultured man we would say he has transcended the culture 
they will be trying something new. He, they will criticize some of the factions in the society, but later he had transcended his own faction. So, with these words, let me congratulate the percentage of this day. Also, uh, Sister Moderator, who has really conducted this uh, way of interaction in a very impressive and also humiliating way. So, thank you very much for all the percentage of our participants. Thank you. First time for the ceremony, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Greetings to everyone present here. On behalf of the St. Charles Ronga Nature Seminary, I, Linus Philemon, deem it a great honor and privilege to stand before you to deliver the gold of tenets. In Psalm 107, verse 1, we read, Oh, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love enjoys forever. To be grateful to the Lord means you are content with what he provides. Therefore, I have a duty to thank the Lord that he made our dreams come true. We give thanks to God, Karunga, Kompa, Pamba, for his grace, guidance, and protection throughout our city. Allow me to express my gratitude to our speakers, our keynote speaker in the ascension, Ms. Lucia Lekunda. Her speech was truly inspiring. It kept us spellbound, and it inspired us. And I'm sure a lot is going to come up after her speech. I wonder if she could be here today. Thank you, Reverend Father Anto Tunduparampil, CMI, for taking up the challenge. Dear Dr. Ushanda Teresia, you truly showed the type of Christian you are, who is not limited by the culture, no, by the baptism. I now get to know that we have a lot of saints in Africa. God didn't forget, not throw them away. Your speech was really thought-provoking. It really made us think. Thank you so much for such a wonderful speech. I am grateful to hear that my culture has a great effect or influence to how I worship. Mr. Katea Cheroni, your speech was deep and well formulated. It was the integration of African philosophy and theology. We are truly enriched, and it was a great lesson to my philosophy and history students <laughs> present here. We are really honored to have you. Please accept our gratitude for your presence. Reverend Father Matthias Shipigona Oemai, your speech was indeed educative on how we can evangelize without destroying the good traits of the people. Thank you so much, Father. Wait and see how we are going to evangelize. Dear seminarians, dear seminarian Athanasius Sanele Nikos, many of us here were skeptical to if there was a true God in Africa. Finally, you came and delivered us from such a dilemma. 
Your speech was inspiring my brother. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dear Reverend Father, Tai Jutania CMR, Rector of the St. Charles Rwanda Major Seminary, our staff members, Reverend Sisters, Priests, Reverend Priests, superiors of different congregations present here, distinguished guests, especially Okulu Kedian Jekashura Dance Academy and Production, we are glad. Thank you for making this event live and a memorable one with your performance. Dear colleagues and sisters, thank you for allowing us to sit and educate ourselves in this beautiful and cool hall. Thank you for everyone who assisted us in any way. Dear fellow students present here, Thank you for blessing this event with your presence. Thank you to everyone present here. We have some snacks and drinks outside. We will share with you all. But this I'm not going to do. Reverend Caesar, Christian Matthew MSC. I don't want to forget you, please forgive me. Thank you for introducing and moderating this great event for the unmoderated seminar is unworthy that the fight was cool. Thank you so much. May your right father bless all of you in abundance. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. So finally, I would like to thank you for your time, attending, and thank you for the special. And let's make this seminar unforgettable. Now I'm requesting all of you to stand for the seminar. Thank you.
Thank you.